Welcome back to Walk with TFB. Tim Bryson here, and as you know, I'm a Black millennial, was eager to have unfiltered conversation with authentic people centered on education, sport, and culture. Today, we are walking with a relationship curator, belonging enthusiast, and former student affairs professional. A Texas native, he stayed in state and earned his bachelor's degree from the one and only Paul Quinn College. While at Paul Quinn, he became highly engaged in student affairs work having served as the vice president of the Student Government Association, Homecoming King, and on the orientation team as well. However, I believe his most influential experience came as a proud initiate of Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. After earning his master's and doctorate degrees, he spent more than 15 years working as a student affairs professional, most notably in the fraternity and sorority life functional area. But in May, and in May 2021, he pivoted out of higher education into ed tech, where he now serves as a diversity, equity, and inclusion leader. In addition to his work experiences, our guest is also a founding member of the Blackberry View. The Blackberry View is a platform with five vastly different queer men who gather for discussions centered on an array of topics, including but not limited to racism, colorism, sex, and dating. I met this dude almost about five years ago when I was in grad school, strictly by divine intervention, and over these last five years, we have had many unfiltered conversations, but this time we get to record it and share it with the world. So without further ado, y'all help me welcome Dr. Zachary Shirley. My brother, my brother. Hey, it's about time, bro. <laughs> it's about time, bro. You know, I, I just want to say, I don't appreciate, I don't appreciate how you just glossed over how much of an influential impact we are in each other's lives. But you know what? I'm not even going to, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm not going to talk about that. Hey, hey, we'll, we'll, that'll come up, that'll come up naturally and organically, right? But before we go uh -huh. any further, I had to take my glasses off for this one. Before we go any further, I was like, oh shit, like, Zach might be the first Sigma that's on my podcast. So I ran some numbers, bro. I've had 46 guests, okay. 16 of which are Greek affiliated in PhD. Okay specifically. I've had five alphas. <laughs> we had to put a pause on that for a while. Three deltas, three kappas, three AKAs, one SG rho, and one omega. I haven't had no sigmas. I ain't had no zetas. And I ain't had no iotas yet. You're the first. Well, as much as I appreciate being the first uh, of, of our fraternity brothers on here, you and I gonna have to talk offline about how you're just <laughs> keeping a frack out the show. We're going to talk about that. Hey, I got, like I told Ash in the last episode, I'm inclusive, bro, but I, ha I got some more frack that I'm about to get on the pod both this season and next. Um, but I'm excited nonetheless. But check mm -hmm. this out, Zach. Like I said, we've had several, really plenty of unfiltered conversations over the last five years. I mean, yeah. you know, you and I both know this, most of which have been organic and unplanned but this one is going to be one that's um, super dedicated and intentional to where we want to go today but before we get started learning more about your story uh, I'm curious um, what our guests and our community and our listeners are also curious to really know and understand what is bringing you black joy right now what is bringing me you said black joy black joy uh what is bringing me black joy right now is honestly the the fact that Black folks continue to step on society's neck, like applying pressure to society's neck. Um, and of course, it ties in a little bit to my role as a DEI leader and practitioner. However, I think that within the last couple of years, um, ever since the murder of George Floyd, and we don't say murder because they murdered that man. Yes, they did. Um, they did. We have seen a, a, an extreme uptick in. Black folks just being tired of society's bullshit. Um, and so what brings me Black joy right now is to see us navigating in spaces that um, we originally weren't let into, but we kicked the door down um, and said, you're going to let us in. Uh, I especially love seeing elevation of, of our Black women um, in positions of leadership and influence um, I have one of my favorite t-shirts says, <laughs> ask a black woman who she's voting for and act accordingly. So I just, I mean, I, that, that, that is what is bringing me joy right now. Um, especially 
at a time where we can't necessarily trust the government in a lot of ways. Uh, y'all can still cancel them student loans, by the way. Um, and, and, and just seeing how society still uh, diminishes our experience. However, we're not deterred by that. Um, and so that's what brings me Black Joy right now. I like how you said that. Yeah, they can't cancel them student loans. I like how you said that. That's good. Kicking the door down and kicking shit ceilings out too. Yeah. And I think we've seen that. And I th- we're going to talk about the student affairs piece. But the more just looking at you just now, I'm like, in many ways, right, we kept a lot of Black folks in student affairs, of course, because people are say, either say, you know, you'll be good for this industry or you'll be good to do X, Y, and Z. But we've really been perpetuating just staying in this box. <laughs> Right. This idea of a box right. keeps coming up on this podcast this season, but we'll we'll dive definitely more into that because um, our skills are definitely uh, bigger than the world of student affairs and can shape mm-hmm. much more than what we believe and or think. But Zach, your story is one that I love hearing every single time. Uh, your doc your doc experience alone could be its own book. I'm mean, gonna say that with love and with grace. Uh, but for those who do not know you, segment one, what is your story? Um, so my story is one of an individual who didn't realize his power until his late thirties. Um, I'm 40 years old now, for those who don't know, I don't mind talking about my age because I'm blessed to make it to 40 because a number of us don't. Um, but I didn't realize my worth and my power until my late thirties. Um, and a lot of that was attributed to therapy. So shout out to therapy, y'all. Go to therapy. Trust me, it's the best shit for you ever. Um, but my story is really one of someone who uh, believes in helping individuals. Like, And it's not just to be cliche. Like, you know, you hear folks say, I just want to help people. No, like I genuinely have given and would still probably give my last for individuals because I know. Um, that we are connected in so many ways as a society. Connectedness is my number one strength and strengths finder. And I wholeheartedly believe in the fact that if I hurt you, that means somehow I inadvertently hurt myself. Um, my story is one of an individual who wasn't going to go to college. Like I had no desire to go to college at all. I graduated high school and was like, fuck this school shit. <laughs> I'm going to work. And now I have a whole terminal degree right here behind me. <laughs> um, based off of the the influence of my mother who has since passed on. Uh, but listen to your mothers, y'all. Listen to your parents. They know, they know us better. Um, so without boring everybody on my whole upbringing, um, I really want to start at a pivotal point in my life, and that's, that, that's senior year of high school. Um, and I was a nerd in high school. I wasn't very popular. Uh, probably a complete 180 from what people know me as now because people say that everybody knows me and I'm very mixy and like everybody knows Zach and all this. Didn't nobody really know me. Um, and I, I sought so much for just, just to be accepted in circles. And I think people don't really understand or talk about how pivotal that is for uh, adolescence and in high school when, when you just want to seek acceptance from your peer group. Um, and I'll never forget, and Tim, you, I, I don't think I've told you this, so you about to hear something that you haven't heard before. The only person that's heard this is my therapist. So uh, we're about to get real deep. But I caught myself uh, wanting to run track in high school. I've never been athletically inclined. Uh, but I thought I was interested in it because I just like to run. Like, I I used to really like to run. And so my mom, being a super supportive individual, was like, you should run track, baby. You know how mamas tell you 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 should do stuff because you they baby, but you really not no good at it. That's what she did with me. Um, So she gassed me up and the gas ran out of that car real quick. But um, the the coach of the track team, Coach Reeves, that was his name, he said something to me that, I now, I continue to play back now, even at age 40. He said, son, you don't have the guy given talent to run track. But what you do have is a phenomenal ass work ethic. And that is going to take you very far. And at the time, I didn't know what that meant as a like 17, 18 year old kid. I just didn't know. Um, 
And so because of that, though, he made me the manager of the track team. And so I automatically got like 20 new big brothers. Um, and it was an amazing experience for me. But one of the things that I really, really wanted and stri- strive for was that, 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 that letterman's jacket, that manager's letterman's jacket. I never got it. Um, for whatever reason, my high school decided that the year that I was graduating, we all were graduating in my year that I was the manager, we're going to stop giving the managers letterman jackets. So I worked my entire year for this goal that I did not attain. And I vowed and promised to myself at that point in time, because I was crushed. I said, never am I going to work so hard for something and not get what I feel like I deserve. Um, And I've carried that with me ever since. So me not getting that letterman jacket, while it fucked me up psychologically as an 18-year-old, it really laid the foundation coupled with my work ethic that Coach Reeves said that I had to have this dogmatic desire to get the shit that was owed to me. Graduated, went to college. Well, no, graduated, went to work, said I wasn't going to college. We can really skip that part of my story because my mom came in one day. I was working at Bank of America thinking I was making big money. She said, I don't know what you're going to tell them people, but you're going to quit that job and you're going to go to school, boy. And that was it. And so that's when um, I enrolled in Paul Quinn College. Uh, my, my twin brother was at Jarvis Christian College at the time, and he was living his life and, and thriving and flourishing. And my mom said, I work two jobs to give you all of what you need and some of what you want. And I have not worked two jobs for you to not go to school. Your job is to go to school. So I went to school. Um, and little did I know that that was going to set me on the trajectory of changing my, my life for forever. Um, and that's why I say, listen to your mama, because your mama know better. <laughs> um, and so, Tim, a lot of the things that you mentioned earlier when you were introducing me, it wouldn't have been possible had she had not told me what I was going to do at that point in time. Um, but I still took that that sentiment with me in college from high school, that work ethic, when I didn't get the damn letter. And I translated that into being pretty much an A student. I translate that into pledging. I wanted to be a Sigma, and I knew I was going to be a Sigma. Once they picked me and took my money, I said, you know what? I don't care what happens. <laughs> but them letters is mine, bro. Um, because I just didn't want to have that feeling that I had at that track banquet. Um, mm-hmm. And I just kept accomplishing goals, achieving, accomplishing goals, achieving. You know, I became that over involved college student because I felt like I had so much energy to give back to others um, that I didn't think about overexerted myself. So like I, orientation leader, I was sophomore class parliamentarian, junior class parliamentarian, uh, vice president for SGA my senior year, chapter president for three and a half years. I was an ambassador to income and like I did all of these things. And also little did I know that what I was doing then was laying the foundation for me to go into student affairs. So um, majored in uh, secondary education, English. So my bachelor's degree right here, this one right here, <laughs> is in secondary education, English. I was going to be a high school English teacher. Um, and I realized that that's not what I wanted to do in life. I realized that there was something else that I was meant to go towards. And so uh, my brother and I, my twin brother and I both graduated in May of 2005 and decided we wanted to go to grad school for higher ed. We didn't know what higher ed was, actually. Um, It took our dean of students at Paul Quinn to tell us what higher ed was. Because we were like, we know we don't want to teach. So what can we do? She says, um, well, what do you like to do? And we talked about all this involvement that we had. By that time, he transferred to Paul Quinn. 
So we were both at the same school. Um, and we talked about how involved we were. And she said, well, why don't you go into student affairs? And we were like, well, what's, what's student affairs? And she said, this is what I do. This is what I get to do every day, come to school, work with y'all. And we were like, you get paid for this? <laughs> and she was like, no, nah, I just come up here and volunteer my time. Of course I get paid for it. So light bulb moment. Like we found what we wanted to do. Uh, made it to a and Commerce after we graduated for our master's degree program. Uh, and just so happy to meet someone. Uh, a young lady, she ended up becoming an AKA, really good friend of ours. Uh, but ended up meeting a young lady, a student assistant at the time in the Office of Diversity and Cultural Affairs in Greek Life. And she said, my boss is looking for a graduate assistant. I said, I'll do it. Like, I, I, I jumped at the opportunity. When it interviewed, I was the only person he interviewed. Uh, this, this man ended up becoming my lifelong mentor and is still my mentor to this day. Um, but I didn't know what I was getting into. Like, I didn't know what this student affairs Greek life world entailed, but I learned very quickly. Um, and so at that point in time, Tim, I knew you couldn't have told me at that point in time that this was not going to be the world that I would live in for the rest of my life. You could have told me I wasn't going to retire as somebody's vice president of student affairs or dean of students or something. You just couldn't have told me that. So my, my boss, he ended up becoming my boss, Dr. Robert Dotson. He asked me one day, he said, son, what do you want to be like? If you could create your dream job, what would it be? And Tim, I was 20, 23 years old, 22 years old, how old I was. And... <laughs> I didn't know what it, I didn't know what that looked like. I didn't know what I was eating for lunch tomorrow. But I was like, well, I know that being a dean is very important. And I know I like Greek life. I want to be an assistant dean for Greek life. And he said, that's what you want to do? I said, that's what I want to do. Boy, I was confident in it too. I said, that's what I want to do. He said, all right, we're going to get you that. Now that's a very important part of the story. Keep that in mind. We're going to hold on to that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so time went on. I finished my master's. My brother and I finished my master's. We started our doctorates. I started getting jobs. Like first, first adult job out of grad school was Texas Women's University. Shout out to TWU for taking a chance on the kid. Uh, I was a Greek Life and Programs coordinator. And I was in charge of three or four major programs at TWU at the time making a whopping $38,100 a year. Looking back, (laughs) I was a damn fool. But at the time, I was doing what I loved. I was working with students. Um, I was making a difference in people's lives. I was helping people. But I always knew kept in the back of my mind. One day, Zach, you're going to be an assistant dean for Greek life. So, ended up leaving TWU, went to University of Texas at Dallas to work in fraternity story life there. I was an assistant director. One thing about my career trajectory is that I either made lateral moves or I made the next level up. I never made a move down. The lateral moves that I made gave me something different, though, that I wasn't getting at that initial position. So um, left TWU as a coordinator, went to UT Dallas as an assistant director. I was overseeing more programs. My title was more. I was making a little bit more money. I was making about $43,000. Cool. Decided that I eventually wanted to go. I wanted to oversee my own fraternity and sorority life department. Because in that department at UT Dallas, we split it between two people. Started working at A&M Commerce in 2011. Um, Gave me the opportunity, again, lateral move. I was an assistant director, but I was the main person in charge of an entire Greek community. Because I needed that experience ever I wanted to be, ding, 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 that assistant dean for Greek life or that director for Greek life. Commerce was the most transformative life experience that I ever had professionally. And I ended up staying at a and Commerce about five years and was promoted twice. 
went from assistant director to associate director once I finished my doctorate. And then a year after that, I became the first ever director for Greek life at a and Commerce. Built my own department, created it from scratch, ground up. Um, um, and that was an, an important experience for me because it showed me that I had the ability to do. Um, and it takes me back again to that Letterman jacket, Zach. And I would look back at Letterman Jack and Zach and I'm like, hey, bro, look at what we doing now. Like, we don't need that Letterman Jack. Look at what you done did. Um, left Adam Commerce in 2017 and branched out and moved out of state, moved to Cincinnati uh, to become the director for Fraternities for Life at the University of Cincinnati. So again, lateral move. However, I was the, the first ever director for Fraternities for a Life at University of Cincinnati. I built the office from the ground up at University of Cincinnati. And it was a bigger institution. Commerce was an institution of 11,000 students. Cincinnati was an institution of about 40,000. So I went from a rural institution to an urban institution. Again, picking up skill sets, picking up skill sets. And so this is where the pivot in the story comes. Looking back, Cincinnati should have been my last job in student affairs. Mm. Because my passion for student affairs and fraternity and sorority life was starting to diminish. But I told myself, no, nah, you just, you know, you just caught up in the motion. This is what you love. This is what you're going to retire doing. You're going to be, you still need to be an assistant dean need to be an assistant dean, Dr. Shirley, because that's what people are telling you you need to be. And the issue now that I see is that I was, I was listening to others over listening to myself. I forgot about me and started trying to walk in the path of what others saw for me. I was more concerned about being Dr. Shirley than I was about being Zach. So, um, Indiana University Bloomington, <laughs> I go who? <laughs> uh, the opportunity came for me to be an assistant dean. Um, I originally interviewed, fun fact, I originally interviewed for an associate dean position at IU. That was the role. He was the associate dean for student life and learning. And the associate dean oversaw essentially a student activities department. That's really what it was. With student organizations, fraternity and sorority life. Um, what else? Uh, programming, um, dance marathon, like all of these major programs. So the associate dean oversaw that. When I interviewed at IU, the vice provost and dean of students saw something in me and said, all right, I don't think that you are right for this position. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a position for you to oversee just Greek life. And the next thing I know, I'm moving to Bloomington, Indiana to be the assistant dean for student life and learning. Okay, cool. Great. Fine. About two months later, <laughs> he comes to me and he says, I want you to make this his own department. You have experience in that, right? I said, yeah. Yeah, I got experience in that. So two months after I started, they took fraternity and career life out of student life and learning. And once again, I was my own department. And I had achieved that dream that goal of 22, 23 year old Zach. And I sat in my boss's office as a grad student and said, I wanna be an assistant dean for Greek life. Mama I made, not only was I an assistant dean for Greek life, but I oversaw one of the largest fraternity and sorority systems in the nation at a big 10 institution. The first ever person of color to oversee 
the Greek system at IU. And at about month three, I didn't want it anymore. At that point in time, I definitely realized, all right, something's wrong. Like, you should be excited. You should be happy. You had this amazing, I had an amazing staff. I had all the support I needed, but I wasn't happy. Um, so I left after about a year. Um, and I moved back to Texas. Uh, my dad had pro my dad uh, ended up getting prostate cancer. Um, my mom passed away in 2012, and so the older that you get, the more you realize uh, you have so much. You only have so much time left with your parents. You only get one mom. You only get one dad. And one of the last things my mom told me before she passed was, "Take care of your father, son." And that just resonated in my head too, like take care of your father. I said, I, I got to go home. I got to go home. So in September of 2019, I packed up and I moved back home and I started working at the University of North Texas as the director for Fraternity and Story Life there. Um, little did any of us know that the world was about to shut down in about six months. And so the pandemic came and at that point in time, I really started asking myself, bro, what the fuck are you doing? Like, like you, you've left these roles, great roles, <laughs> but you're not fulfilled. Like you're not, something, something about this isn't bringing you that joy that you used to get. Um, and I think everything hit at once to him. It was the pandemic, murder of George Floyd, murder of Breonna Taylor, like the, the super surge of Black Lives Matter, um, and the unmasking of or or the pulling back of the curtain that is higher education. And I started saying to myself, as I saw colleagues of mine leave the field, leaving the field was never, like, I'd never in my wildest dreams would have thought that that would be something that I would do. But I saw my friends and colleagues leaving the field because they were starting to identify what I had known in that there's a, there's a, there's a level of toxicity in higher ed that is masked. Um, and that's not to say that toxicity doesn't exist everywhere. However, wage disparities, lack of resources, the expectation to do more with less, um, the lack of resources for individuals who are staff. I was working at an institution where we had full-time staff who needed to access the same food pantry that the students access because they weren't making enough money to sustain themselves. I've worked at institutions where staff would have to take another or two other part-time jobs just to make ends meet but they were expected to stay, stay at work past five, work on weekends, sacrifice everything. That level of incongruency had always existed, but I think it just hit me in the face in a way that it never had before. I was working at UNT um, and one of, I was sitting here talking about therapy and going to therapy. And we were in a staff meeting, and one of my staff looked at me and said, I wish I could afford to go to therapy. And that that just that that blew me. Like that hit me in a way that angered me. Not at her, but at our system. 
how is it that we have individuals who are not able to afford mental health care? But it also goes into the systemic issues of our nation, period. <laughs> right. So that, you know, that's 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 the issue of our nation. Um, but as these as the curtain started peeling back more and more, I started realizing that. There's an issue with this organization as a whole, not just this institution, but the, the organization of higher education as a whole that needs to be worked on. Um, Dr. Jamie Riley, when he was, uh, when he left Alabama, um, wrote this piece that, that still rings very true to me today. Higher ed ain't safe for Black folks. And I really had to sit with that, Tim. Like, why is it not safe for us? Um, and I started to identify the reasons why. So we started 2021. And I pray that I would not start another fall semester as an employee in higher ed. <laughs> and in May of this year, I left. I got an amazing opportunity. And that's when I pivoted into ed tech. Um, and I haven't looked back since. Um, and so I don't know if I answered the question of what my story is when you initially asked me. But I hope that that was something that 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 folks can get something out of. <laughs> I'm also very transparent, so I'm gonna be quiet now. Okay, first of all, you're not gonna be quiet because you're the one being featured and interviewed on this podcast. Mm-hmm. Secondly, we should be one A and one B. Thank you for sharing all of what you share. Um, seriously, all, all of it, because all of it is not just connected and helps to inform us more about you help us to inform more about you and your story. But now getting into segment two, I'm glad you mentioned this last quote, right? That higher ed is not safe for black people. Mm-hmm. Because that's something, and I was reading some tweets earlier on Instagram, whatever the hell it was. But as I mentioned earlier in this conversation, I think we get we as black people get pulled into these roles, right? Representation matters. People need to see right. us. We love helping. Right. We get pulled in. And then we, I speak for myself, we feel stuck. But I can't, mm-hmm. the students, I can't leave. The students need me, right? I can't leave if right. I said I'm the only... And so I think about things you were saying earlier about Letterman, uh, Letterman jacket, Zach. I like that. I like that alliteration, that phrase. Or thinking about, you know, um, your work ethic, right? You were just working, working, mm-hmm. working. You love to help. But finally, you chose self and chose to pursue and step out of higher education in a way that prioritized Zach um, and put Dr. Shirley in the background, in the foreground for a little, for a little bit. And so talk to us more, particularly about, um, I know you mentioned therapy earlier. But talk to us more about how you still negotiated and it came to a decision where you were able to choose yourself, right, without having to feel and or sense uh, much guilt to want to stay in a space that you know was not good for your overall health. I have an, I have an example that turned the page for me. Um, and but before I give the example, I I, I definitely want to. emphasize what you mentioned about this guilt trip that we are on as, that we are given as black people right talk about it um what about the students mm-hmm. well you're the only you're the only face that represents their experience what about them um one of my i say How can I say this? I have been I have been guilty of looping people in to higher ed in that very way because that's how I was looped in. Um, and it's just it's 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 a repetition. It's a repetition, you know. Your face is needed here. Your presence is needed here, and it is needed. Don't get me. Our black and brown students need to see black and brown professionals. 
they need to see. I used to, when I was at AM Commerce in my office, it was set up just like this almost. And my front door faced where I'm looking. And my students were walking, young men especially, were walking in. And the first thing they would see is me at my desk, and then they would look up and see my degrees. And when I left commerce, I had three of my young men tell me, you know, and 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 we boo hoo like we my my reception, <laughs> my going away reception at commerce. The catering folks said, "You've seen a lot of going away receptions, Dr. Shirley. And yours is the second largest that we have seen." Um, and it was grown men in there crying. Like I was crying, they was like, "It was." You would have thought it was a funeral. Um, and three of my young men came up to me from the mentor program that I started and said, um, and I and and I started it, but then Brad ended up taking it over because it just once I was promoted to director, I couldn't I couldn't manage both of them. But um, they came up to me and said, every day we were walking your office, and every day we saw a black man who has achieved the upper echelon of education. And because of that, we know that we can do that too. And it's those moments that I miss in higher ed. It's those moments that allow me to know that the work that I did was not in vain. And so our students need to see that. Um, and because of that, I perpetuated the, well, you know, Tim, they need you, Tim. You know, Harold, they need you, Harold. You know, like, I've done that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I definitely want to acknowledge that piece. What, what broke it for me, though, was... Um, we had a situation at University of North Texas, and and I can't believe it was it was this year. It was earlier this year, um, where there was a incident uh, where there was a shooting on Fraternity Row, um, and it was. It involved some of our fraternity men from IFC and some individuals who I who to this day I don't believe they're affiliated with UNT. Like I don't think they were enrolled, but men of color, black and brown. And essentially, to make a long story short, uh, what started it was the hurling of racial slurs at these young men by these members of these fraternities. And it gets to a point, um, who was it? Was it Langston Hughes that said this? The Negro, sweet, docile, meek, and kind beware the day that they change their minds. I think I'm paraphrasing, but when I think about that line of prose and I think about that particular line and where the day that they changed their mind, I think gone are the days of somebody calls somebody the N-word or, or some type of racial slur and they walk away. I think those days are gone. <laughs> and I think in this instance, that day was gone. And so these young men, went back and followed these men to the fraternity house. Um, and a brawl ensued. And um, it, it, turned, it turned really violent really fast. And I remember being in bed on a Sunday morning. It was a beautiful Sunday morning. I was going to get up go to kickboxing, go to brunch, do Sunday fun day, because, you know, 
folks talk about the gay agenda. The gay agenda is Sunday fun day and it starts with brunch. Um, so I was ready. Had my outfit laid out, all that. It's about 7.03 in the morning. I get a phone call. Have you checked your email? I, no, I haven't. <laughs> um, check my email. I see police reports, all of that. Like, I see what has happened. And as I am digesting this information, I look outside and realize there goes my whole Sunday. There goes my whole Monday. There goes my Tuesday, my Wednesday, and probably my Thursday. Like, it was bad. Um, and as word started getting around about what happened, because, you know, college students don't wake up till about two o'clock in the afternoon. Anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, as word started getting around about what happened and more and more details were found out, we, we found out more and more about what caused it, how this happened. And I was getting messaging from my MPHC and MGC students. Zach, what you gonna do? And it wasn't what I was gonna do about, you know, who who shot who or who got injured or any of that. I was at a crossroads as the administrator's role and a black man. Mm-hmm. 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 And at that point in time, I felt this just this this feeling in me, Tim, that was like I'm literally caught in the middle of this. And um I don't know what to do because I have one community looking at me like, all right, you know, we we have this issue, we have this problem, and it's definitely not to minimize what happened because I don't condone gun violence at all. Don't shoot nobody. Like, <laughs> like if you're gonna fight, all right, I don't condone violence, period. But if you're gonna fight, fight, but don't don't pull out a gun. The other end, I have communities of color looking at me like, they they, they didn't call these men out their names. They have, and now they're weaponizing their whiteness. Um, And that was, that was literally said to me. And so now I'm stuck in the middle. And at that point in time, I knew, I said, this is, not only do I not get paid enough to be yeah. experienced, yeah, say that. let's also talk about the psychological trauma that I am going to be put through. Um, and for what? And for what? And so at that, that was the that was the point that I knew. I can't, I can't, I I can't do this anymore. I'm the problem. Let me remove myself from the situation. So I hear you, right? And and I'm a thousand percent aligned with you. But as you're telling this story, and it's something as I reflect on my own experience um, at my institution right now, for me, it's it's the system, the structure, our institutions, not recognizing, not um, compensating us for the humanity that we bring to our work, Right. Mm-hmm. And as you just mentioned, like being caught in this crossfire, I'm in the career development space. Obviously, your twin brother also used to be in the career development space. And it's like our black students, they're not showing up. Right. So we got like we're trying to find, be innovative in ways to get them. To, that's not in our job description. We're not getting compensated for that. We're not getting recognized for that. We're not getting, I mean, the list just goes straight down. And so thinking about your role, again, we can talk about UNT, we can talk about UT Dallas, we can talk about commerce or um, Texas Women's University, but like thinking about your role, particularly within FSL. I'm curious to really know what was it about that community and particularly those students affiliated with those organizations 
that at least for the well, 15 years kept you involved? Like, like why FSF? Um, because I saw what it did for me as an undergrad. I got my lettering jacket. When I became a Sigma, I got my Letterman jacket. That's Why good. I traded in a Letterman jacket for a line jacket? For a line jacket, this is good. I like this. Um, good. I, I was chapter president for three and a half years. I was on the national international board for the NPHC for four years. I was in spaces that allowed a shy. a shy kid from Duncanville, Texas, from Oak Cliff, Texas, who didn't like to public speak at all, who would not speak up in crowds, who would be just meek and timid. I was provided a space to provide my input, my expertise. Um, I tell people all the time, I used to be extremely introverted. Um, and still in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm introverted for a different reason now that I'm older. But I used to be, I used to not speak up. Like I said, I used to be meek and timid and shy. And every time I tell people that, they can't believe because of how I am now. Like, if I were to tell you, tell them that I was shy and meek and timid, you would probably be like, bro, that's bullshit. <laughs> no, y'all definitely say that's bullshit. <laughs> definitely um, say that's bullshit. But my my affiliation in Sigma, Sigma Sigma awakened that in me, and I saw how this membership is a transformative experience. I wanted to create that for other people. I wanted to identify the shy, meek, timid kid at orientation and say, "Listen." there's still a place for you here. Mm -hmm. You may not have got your letterman jacket in high school, but there's a place for you here. And time and time again, I saw how affiliation in a fraternity or a sorority would transform these students in the most amazing ways. Some it would transform in not so amazing ways. But for a lot of them, like leadership development, um, just overall self-confidence, that is why I spent 16 years working in FSL because I said, if it did it for me, it can do it for someone else. And they just need to see somebody who used to be like them on the other side of this. And that person was me. I mean, it was you for 15 years across what? Four, five, six institutions, institution. three states, three, four states. Three, three states. So <laughs> this, this is a good kind. This is good. It's this line jacket, letterman jacket, I'm going to be thinking about all day, bro. But as I think about, you mentioned like the perfect storm, which is what I've called summer 2020 with the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and many, many, many others. But I called it the perfect storm because it was a time where everyone had to lock in on the TV, some monitor, some screen, mm -hmm. and you had to just sit with it. Yep. You, you, we didn't have a, we had to sit with it. And right. so one of, the, one of the things you mentioned earlier was right, like the, the with about black joy, um, seeing us kick down doors, like break ceilings, whatever the case may be, we had to sit with it. And so mm -hmm. as you pivoted, as we sat with it, you sat with it, you made a then decision to pivot out of higher education, excuse me, higher education and student affairs. Talk to us more about what you're doing now, particularly within the ed tech space and how your um, experiences and skills and student affairs have translated over. Sure. So I am blessed to be the diversity, equity, and inclusion leader for a company called Cambium Assessment. Um, and Cambium Assessment essentially is a, um, it was, it's an assessment organization um, under Cambium Learning Group. And so any standardized tests that you took between K through 12 was probably written, scored, <laughs> or whatever, in any iteration of that process by Cambium Assessment or one of our competitors, uh, ER, ERS or Pearson. Uh, so my job at Cambium is, I would say twofold, but it's more folds than that. One, 
um, I'm working, I work directly with our diversity, uh, equity and inclusion council on just all things DEI within the business unit. So the creation of employee resource groups, um, honoring heritage months, um, working to create more inclusive meeting spaces for individuals, um, working with HR to uh, modernize terminology, modernize practices, like for instance, removing gender binary terms from benefits packages. No one would think about that, but everybody's not on the binary. Uh, <laughs> creating training and development opportunities for members within the organization to learn more about DEI, so whether it's pronoun usage, um, generations in the workforce, um, working with uh, colleagues with disabilities, whether visible or non-visible, all the veterans, like all of that, running the gamut of DEI. Um, I'm also charged with uh, initiating and completing our strategic plan around DEI. So how are we hiring more diverse individuals within the business unit? How, where are we, um, where are we drawing our candidates from? What does our candidate pool look like? Um, are we engaging in more diverse organizations to help bring more diverse people into the business? Um, I'm also charged with determining various organizations that we can partner with from a DEI measurement standpoint to see where we are in our work. Um, so yeah, I, and I'm sure I'm leaving some other stuff out, but that is the gist of my role. Um, I report directly to the president of Camium Assessment. And, you know, we, we have a very cohesive relationship. And even though I'm a solitary practitioner in my role at this point in time, I'm the only DEI person here. Um, Cambium Assessment is also only about two years old. We were recently acquired from another organization called AIR, American Institute for Research. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we are building our DEI uh, path from the ground up. So it is very exciting to be in this work, how my <laughs> skill set from higher ed translates. I've built stuff before. <laughs> I've built three offices for paternity story life from the ground up. I've done the strategic planning. I've done the relationship building. I've done the training and development. Um, I've been a solitary practitioner and I've overseen a staff of upwards of 12 people and everything in between. So I have the ability to pivot between um, multiple changing environments and bring that skill set. Um, I also have the ability to, or bring with me the ability to um, critically think from a theoretical standpoint um, and also a pragmatic standpoint. So again, the ability to pivot. Um, and finally, relationship building skills. The thing about working in the private sector is that relationship building skills, they, they can be hit or miss. Um, but one, one, of the, one of the positive things I will say about higher ed, and there are, some, there are a number of positive things I can say, um, we're taught to build relationships and we're taught to work collaboratively. And so those are some of the, when I, when I was looking at this role and applying, um, those are some of the, the, the skill sets that I bring with me from the arena of higher education into this role and into just the world of ed tech. So I got one question for you. Hopefully okay. it's one word, maybe two, depending on the adjective you used before it. But as you pivoted out and now are working in your new role, are you happy? Hell yes. <laughs> Two words. <laughs> oh, Zach, Dr. Shirley, let me do this. Before we get to segment three, I, it would be remiss of me not to at least bring up, because we have we got to have a part two for sure, the Blackberry View. As uh -huh. I mentioned before, five vastly different queer men, as verbatim from y'all's description, who gather, for, who gather for discussion centered on an array of topics. And literally, array is exactly what it means <laughs> yes exactly exactly, exactly it's, what it it's means exactly, it's exactly what it means simultaneously it also doesn't even accurately describe 
<laughs> so, and the same time. Give me something. Give us, I mean, give the people and give us, give our community just a description in regards to why it was created, um, its purpose. And I would even go as far to say and emphasize why it's needed. Um, it was created because our, our, our creator, uh, Adrian Neal Jr., who was also a member of Phi Beta City, um, he plays in Ohio. Um, he, he saw a need for something that wasn't the stereotypical Black gay cattiness um, that would, would be our version of like reality TV. So there, you know, there are various shows out here chasing Dallas, chasing Atlanta, et cetera, et cetera, that shows one, that shows like more so the, the real housewife side of the community. We wanted to be informative. We wanted to be um, agents of the community. We wanted to be change agents. We wanted to be educators. We wanted to be individuals who um, brought the whole authentic lifestyle of, of Black gay men, Black queer men to the forefront. Um, it, it, it was created to be able to represent as many facets of the Black gay community as possible. So um, all five of us are very, we, we're very unique. We, we have similarities, but obviously we're not monolithic and we were chosen for specific reasons. Adrian represents, that's, that's like our, our, our fashion girl, our fashionista. Like you, you can see Adrian in high-waisted pants and heels, or you can see him in a, in a, in a jogging suit. And he just, he navigates various aspects. Um, and he represents um, what would be seen as the more feminine side of the community. Q is our resident, like, fine artisan. Like, he's classically trained in opera, amazing singing voice, um, but he's, he's a nerd. Like, he's a self-proclaimed nerd. Um, and oftentimes, guys like him are ignored in our community mm. uh, for whatever reason. Um, and so he, and he's also the, the, the quieter, soft-spoken. Harold represents another facet of the community that's either fetishized or ignored the darker skinned, bigger guy. Um, but Harold is also our pro, pro, pro black, like super pro black. Uh, very well spoken, very well read. Um, but he represents that aspect of the community. Chris is the body boy. Chris is, he's the youngest. Um, he's like the the energetic body boy, like he's the one that like chiseled abs, like muscles, all of that. Um, but I think that people neglect the fact that Chris is extremely intelligent. Um, Chris is um, very driven from a professional standpoint. Like he's about to start a doctoral program, uh, but they just see this outward facade of him that, that makes him desirable, but I don't think they take a deeper dive into who he is. Um, and then me, I'm the oldest out of the group. Um, I bring the sage wisdom. I bring the, um, the experience of just living life. Um, I'm the doctor. <laughs> uh, so I bring the educational piece. I bring the critical thinking piece. Um, but I also bring the piece of the community that you know, everybody's not attracted to the short, nerdy guy. Again, you know, I'm Q and I are very similar in our nerdy aspect, but I mean, um, and, and again, I'm the older one. So in the community, once you hit a certain age, you're seen as like ancient and need to be put out for retirement. And so I'm 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 pretty much almost there, you know, and so we all come together, though, to represent these aspects of the community, but also show individuals that there's more to us than what 
uh, society deems us. And by society, we mean both uh, Black heterosexual society and Black homosexual society, because there's also a caste system within the gay community. You're too short. You're too skinny. You're too old. You're too fat. You're too Black. You're too, like, you know, you, there's a deficit with, with almost all of us. Um, but we're here to show people that, you know, you can, we all have something to give, right? So um, that is what, that is what we, rep- that's what we represent. It's needed because it ain't shit like it. <laughs> no, it, no, it really ain't. It, it really ain't like I'm gonna leave this right there because I'm speaking this into existence. I know we talk about this offline. We are doing a collab. Y'all we are doing a collab. TFB, I'm gonna be on the on the Blackberry view. Like we doing a collab. We doing a collab for sure because there's plenty we can talk about. <laughs> plenty we can talk about. Plenty. Yo, I'm, I'm gonna leave it right there just for that because we definitely gonna do something. I'm gonna fly to Dallas to make that make that shit happen for sure. I already told you this. No, and it ain't, it ain't, this ain't a secret. Hey, you you got somewhere to stay. Exactly, bro. Well, check this out. Segment three, Zach, as we head out of here, as we get closer to the ending of our show, um, how can I, but also how can our podcast community best support you? Um, you shared a lot on this episode about your personal life, right? It's your career, your work life, Blackberry View, but how can we support uh, human Zach? Um, I would say support me by supporting each other. Um, I mentioned earlier, connectedness is my number one strength and strengths finder. Uh, what, what my Black Green classmates have challenged me with, because we, we had a retreat, I hate retreats, but Adrian had us have a retreat, but it ended up being all right. Um, and we all challenged each other with something. Um, and one of the things that I was challenged with was to be more, um, to to be more, not necessarily forthcoming, not necessarily transparent, but uh, I talk a lot about me too. Um, and like I said, there's there's so much I have to unpack. Letterman Jack is Zach, Dr. Doctor Z versus actual Zach, um, growing old, heartbreak, relationship, disappointments, like all of that. Um, and so I've just recently been able to really start unpacking that from a therapeutic standpoint. What I what I'm saying to say all of that is, uh, be kind to each other. Like, folks go through shit. You know, far too often people aren't comfortable with sharing how they feel because they feel they're going to be judged or ostracized. Um, stop that shit. Like, literally, stop that shit. If somebody is expressing themselves, you have two choices: support them in all that they're going through however that looks like for them ask them how they need you to support them or to just remove yourself from it. but please don't make them feel bad please don't rag on them about it please don't like if somebody puts something up on facebook or social media or something you can either ignore it or you can engage if you don't have the bandwidth to engage don't engage if you do have the bandwidth to engage and you're genuine about it do so um but, you know, I've seen far too many times, especially on Facebook, when somebody expresses something from a mental health standpoint, folks will comment and be like, you know, anybody want to hear that sad shit? First of all, boy, fuck you. Um, <laughs> and so I would say support me by supporting each other because we are all connected and you never know when you're going to be the one who needs that listening ear um, or that watchful eye. And yeah, support the Blackberry View. Like, follow us on Instagram at the Blackberry View. Uh, season one is up on YouTube. You can look for us at the Blackberry View on YouTube. Um, support us on I Elevate. We are on a streaming service now, so we it's it's a black owned streaming service, and it's got black as fuck content. So um, it is a subscription, but the subscription like four ninety nine a month. Y'all spend more than that at happy hour. You spend more than that on Black Friday. You spend more than that uh, going to the Cheesecake Factory on your all-inclusive brunches with your girlfriends. You spend more than that, insert whatever here. You spend more than that on these damn shoes that you only going to get a couple of uses and wears out of before they get racked. So support us on I Elevate, please. And um, yeah. 
<laughs> oh, you're a funny dude, bro. You're a funny dude. And I'll drop y'all's uh, info in the description of this podcast, too, so people will have that information. But, Zach, before we bounce, a couple um, lightning round, if you will, to think what the podcast is called this shit. So what immediately okay. comes to mind, I'll give you a statement and or question. The first of which, and this is going to be fucking hilarious, but what is your favorite sports memory? My favorite what? <laughs> your favorite sports memory. Are the one you watched, <laughs> participated in, <laughs> tailgated for. Why are you laughing? <laughs> Go ahead, bro. Uh, well, as I said earlier, I am definitely not athletically inclined. But um, I think my favorite sports memory. Uh, I always loved tailgates. Like, tailgating was like, to me, what's the point of the game when you go to the tailgate? And you just you you just catch up with like everybody from like either home, I especially love homecoming tailgates. Uh, they just be lit. I'm laughing. So that like, is. Go ahead. What? I said what, I'm laughing because you called me one time on Super Bowl, bro, and I'm like, you're not watching the game. You like what game is on? I'm like, yes. That's why I was laughing, bro. Like, yes, yes. <laughs> I I was like, there's a game on. <laughs> Next question: Your top five artists, top five musical artists. No, you don't have to rank them one through five in order, but top five. PJ Morton. Um, Division. Yes, yeah, he's a sleeper, bro. Are they a sleeper? Uh, oh, PJ Morton Division. Um, I fucks with Pink. I do fucks with Pink. That's my homie. Uh, who else? Uh, let me look at my phone because this, this is the easiest way for me to figure this out. Uh, do, do, do. uh, I do love Bruno Mars, that's number four, and then. Oh, uh, Layla Hathaway. Layla Hathaway? Mm-hmm. I ain't heard of them yet. Okay. Layla Hathaway is Donnie Hathaway's daughter. Hmm. Learn something new today. Of course, the wise, the sage. Yeah. The sage. This is going to be funny as shit. All right. <laughs> if you could go to a brunch, bottomless brunch, drag, <laughs> uh-huh. brun- drag brunch, <laughs> Sunday fun day brunch, <laughs> but you're going to brunch. You plus five people. They could be living and or deceased. Who are you bringing? Um, dead ass. Uh, and in no particular order, right? No particular order. Uh, Michelle LeVon Robinson Obama. Um, that's a boy. Uh, I'm gonna bring tell I'm gonna bring you because I already know that it, we gonna we gonna just be ignorant as fuck. And <laughs> I just feel like I mean you just see you be laughing at me and I don't even think I'll be saying that funny. Why do you I'm know like, this woman's whole laughing. name, bro? Why do you know her whole government name? Because I am in love with her and the internet is hers. Oh, all right. uh, so that's why when people say <laughs> You, Michelle LeVon Robinson Obama. Um, Barack can wait in the car. Um, I would bring uh, Monica. Mm. Like, I love Monica as an artist, but I think she'd be even more, like, even doper to hang out with just as a person. Because, you know, I'm all about Gunica, gang, gang. Um, let's see. Uh, uh oh, Travante Rose, oh boy from Moonlight. Cause right, that's my l- husband. Let me let me let me bring the last person. 
Okay, you bring last first. We got to bring Will Smith. First of all, we're going to leave Will, Will Smith. We don't need to bring Will Smith to brush. We need to bring him to therapy. That's <laughs> when we need to bring him. I'm bad, bro. He's not invited. Who you want to bring him? I, I got questions, <laughs> I just got a lot of questions. He, he need, yeah, well, listen, I got questions too. Uh, the last person that I'm bringing, um, honestly, that ass, I would bring my mom. Mm. I bring my mom. It's a good table. That's a really good table. I'm glad to be invited to that brunch, bro. Yeah. Well, the last question. She's going to see me lick Trevante's face, though. Like, I'm going to lick his whole face. I'm going to lick his face in front of y'all. That I'm, I'm going to record Ooh. it. I'm, I'm going to document it. I mean, Please bro. do. Listen, Please do it. I'm going hey, to document it. But last question for you before we bounce. Who do you want to see and or hear from on the Walk With TFB podcast? Um, I mean, if you could get Michelle LeVar Robinson Obama, I mean, I would be mad. But um, I would actually like, I think that it would be powerful for you to have a conversation with some trans women, Black trans women. Mm. Because there's this disconnect um, between the heterosexual black male community and black trans women. Um, and, you know, I was talking with some frat the other day, three heterosexual black men. Um, and one of them was like, yeah, I hate when people say that black cis, cisgender heterosexual black men are the white men of the black community. And I said, all right, while I understand that the, the, the statement is jarring, do you understand why that is? Cisgender heterosexual black men possess a level of power and privilege mm-hmm. that, while it is lesser than that of cisgender heterosexual white men, it still is at the upper echelon of our community. Conversely, at the bottom of that is black trans women. And so there needs to be a conversation on um, closing that gap as much as we can, because at the end of the day, when we say black lives matter, it's all of the black lives that matter. You know, and and so I think that that would be impactful, especially for the platform of viewers that you have to. Help me make that happen. I can help you make that happen. Help me make that happen. I'm with it. I'm with it. I'm, I'm glad I see it. That's why I love you, bro. That's why I love you. Hey, bro, challenge I got us. you, bro. Challenge me, challenge us. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Help me make that happen. I'm, I'm going to leave sure. it right there but before we go anything any last words that you want to share with our people before we close out this episode um last words um mm. i've emphasized it before but i emphasize it again you know um take care of your mental health y'all find a way um, and 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 help those who share their mental health struggles because, like as cliche as it sounds, you never know. Like you just never know what somebody is living. Just because they carry it well, don't mean it ain't. Well said. Well said. Well, Doctor Zach, Human Zach. I'm gonna start calling you Human Zach, bro. <laughs> you may not have gotten your Letterman jacket. You may not have got your letterman jacket. I might, I might get you one for your 45th or your 41st. We can't wait. But I'm glad you got your lawn jacket, bro, because if you did, had not gotten your lawn jacket, we would have never met. That's true. We would have never That's met. True. So I'm glad you got That's your true. lawn jacket. I'm glad we're in community with each other and still in community, still choose to be in community with each other almost five years later. Uh, so I want to say thank you again for your, transpar- your transparency, your vulnerability, uh, but just being you. Thank you, brother. And I love you too, bro. As always, I love you too, man. As everybody else, man, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Walk with TFB. A phenomenal conversation, um, for sure. And definitely cannot wait to share this uh, with you all very, very soon. Um, look forward to having more unfiltered conversation with authentic educators um, since our education, sport, and culture. But as always, until then, walk with me.